or I think we're finally in a position to uh, really start knocking out some really quick videos here. I know all the videos so far have been pretty wieldy, right? A lot, a lot of information, right? A lot of uh, material to cover. But in this video, we're going to just knock out the rest of uh, chapter four on the act of expression from John Dewey's art as experience. And then we'll move on to the following chapter. We're just going to have a brief look at uh, the expressive object, that's chapter five. And that, that'll be pretty quick. We're not gonna look at it, uh, we're not gonna get super in depth. So this video hopefully will be a lot shorter than the rest. And, and, and the next one will be on substance and form, the following chapter. And really, um, if you followed what, we, what, what I've been covering so far, uh, I would say this video about halfway through it uh, will be the beginning kind of the optional material. And from this point on, I, you could probably skip you know, I don't know when I'll be done with the whole series. I'll probably uh, uh, film a few more later today and maybe tomorrow, but I'm hoping to have the entire series on Dewey complete by Friday, by the end of the week, hopefully earlier. Um, and it's looking like it's gonna be about 12 videos once it's all said and done. Uh, so we've got a few more left. But like I said, you could probably skip to the end. Uh, once we get about halfway through this video, uh, you're gonna have a pretty darn, broad general view of Dewey's overall uh, philosophy of art. So just keep that in mind um, as you, uh, you know, dive through all this material, if it gets overwhelming. Well, I'm going to repeat this uh, quote that I ended on last time, because I don't think I really uh, gave it justice. Uh, I was kind of rushing to get that video finished. And so we've only got a couple of quotes left from chapter four, uh, where he's dealing primarily with artistic expression. And he starts talking towards the end about the relationship between our emotions, these emotional impulses that we all have, and the act of artistic expression. So again, I'm gonna reread this quote from the last lecture uh, that we ended with. Expression is the clarification of turbid emotion. Our appetites know themselves when they are reflected in the mirror of art. As, and as they know themselves, they are transfigured. Emotion that is distinctly aesthetic then occurs. It is not a form of sentiment that exists independently from the outset. It is an emotion induced by material that is expressive. And because it is invoked by and attached to this material, it consists of natural emotions that have been transformed. Right, so why does art work so effectively? Why does art make us laugh, make us cry? These emotions come from the art itself. They are reflected in the mirror of art, as he puts it here. Um, and we know these emotions, we've felt them ourselves, and that's why when we see them acted out on stage or in a movie or something like this, they move us as well to the same emotions if they're effective. And so he says, it's not a form of sentiment that exists independently from the outset. We might go into the movie with, in a good mood, happy, and then it's a sad movie, we, we become sad. Uh, it's an emotion that's induced by the material, expressive material, uh, and it transforms us, right? It transforms our mood because of its intensity, right? Because of its effectiveness. This transformation is the very essence of the change that takes place in any and every natural or original emotional impulsion when it takes the indirect road of expression instead of the direct ro road of discharge. By now, you should kind of get a feel of, or you should kind of understand generally what the difference is, right? If you don't, you need to review previous videos, right? The difference between expression and a direct road of discharge. Irritation may be let go like an arrow directed at a target and produce some change in the outer world. But having an outer effect is something very different from ordered use of objective conditions in order to give objective fulfillment to emotion. That would be expression for Dewey, right? So I'm, I, you know, I have an outer effect, right? Not by just some emotional outburst. No, the, the, the effect is the fulfillment of emotion, sure, but it's, again, through a medium. Again, review the, review the previous video, the video, video before that, uh, if you still don't quite get this, okay? Um, the latter alone is expression, right? When we use the medium, right, to channel our emotions through some artistic medium. 
So that alone is expression. And the emotion that attaches itself to or is interpenetrated by the resulting object is aesthetic. Okay, so we have an aesthetic emotion that is ma made manifest. I love to use that word, Schopenhauer. It's one of his favorites. Uh, it's made manifest in this object, which is in that case aesthetic, right? It's the product of this original impulse, this original emo emotion. If the person in question puts his room to rights, this is an interesting um, example that he gives here. You might not like it, and, and some might criticize him for this example. I, I already mentioned this in a previous video that one criticism you might have of Dewey is that his theory of art is too general. It's too broad. He allows way too many things to count as art. Uh, and so, again, if a person puts his room to rights as a matter of routine, well, for, for that, in that case, Dewey's going to say that's an aesthetic, right? It's not, it's not an aesthetic experience, okay? Uh, however, right, if his original emotion of impatient irritation has been ordered and tranquilized by what he's done, the orderly room reflects back to him the change that has taken place in himself. He feels not that he has accomplished a needed chore, but has done something emotionally fulfilling. His emotion as thus objectified is aesthetic, okay? So cleaning your room in and of itself is not an aesthetic experience, but it can be depending on what it, what is it the result of? Is it the result of just a routine? Like you wake up every morning and you, you just routinely out of habit, clean your room and put it in order? Or does it, does it stare at you, right? That emotion has this environment, sorry, that, that, that environment um, breeds a certain emotion in you. It, you have this emotional reflex to the mess and the clutter of the room. It gives you an irritation and a disorder and an uncomfortableness. And once you set all that to order, and you can kind of sit back and relax and, ah, you know, there's this sort of breath of fresh air as, as, as order is, is presents itself. For, the, for, for Dewey, that's the essence of an aesthetic experience, right? There's this tension, a, 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 a reaction to the environment, strife, and then eventually an overcoming and accumulation of, of forces, right? That is the aesthetic, right? So now we get to the next chapter, right? We're done finally with um, the uh, chapter four, um, the act of expression. And now he's going to talk about the object, right? He was already starting to there. He saw in the last quote, um, you know, the object itself, if it is the result of this emotional uh, impulse, right? If it, if it is the result of this, this deep emotional reaction that I want to uh, make manifest through this channel of art, right? Then the object I create from that inspiration is an expressive object for Dewey, right? And so it's gonna have, if it's, it's become a good artist, it's gonna have that effect on other people. When they see it, they're gonna, they're gonna draw from it that same emotion, that same, maybe not the same exact sadness, obviously, right? Like I might write a poem because I'm sad because I lost my girlfriend or whatever, right? You know, she broke up with me and I'm sad, right? So I write a poem about this, okay? That's my breakup. That's my personal link. But if somebody else, they can relate to that. They've had a similar experience. They'll read the poem, they'll read the song, and it'll evoke the same or similar uh, emotions, okay? And so again, here's Dewey with his criticism of theories, art theories, uh, unlike his own, who try to detach um, um, emotion and express, uh, uh, sorry, emotion and other things uh, from artistic expression in, in one way or the other, right? Depends on the, the theorist we're talking about. Uh, but I suppose that Dewey's right, that this is something that, that some, at least some aesthetic, you know, uh, philosophy, philosophers of art will do. <clears throat> so, so he says, theories which seize upon expression as if it denoted simply the object always insist to the uttermost that the object of art is purely representative of other objects already in existence. So in other words, <clears throat> the, uh, the, the, the song that I write about my breakup, it represents every other breakup. It's a universal expression, right? And so it just represents something that already exists. He doesn't like this. Dewey does not like this notion of, of art as representational, right? As, uh, you know, we already talked in previous videos of his beef with the Greek conception of art as just 
pure imitation, right? He doesn't like it either to be seen as representative. You know, it just stands for other things. That's what scientific symbols do, mathematical equations and formulae. For Dewey, those symbolize other qualitative things. But for art, it's different. It's not a representation, at least in that sense. So for him, our art theorists that do this ignore the individual contribution, which makes the object something new. So it's not representing something else. It's a thing of its own. They dwell upon its universal character, upon its meaning. And for him, meaning is an ambiguous term. And we'll talk about that in a moment. On the other hand, isolation of the act of expressing from the expressiveness possessed by the object leads to the notion that expression is merely a process of discharging personal emotion. And we've already seen why he doesn't like that conception of expression as you know, pure emotional discharge. But what's his beef with this notion of representation? Again, he prefers you know, perhaps the term presentation. We're presented with something new. It's not a representation necessarily of something else. And he comes back to this metaphor, which he's used before, of wine, right? The wine and the wine press, the juice that is squeezed and extracted from the grapes, right? This is not something, the juice doesn't represent something else. The juice is something new, right? So how does this apply to art? How is this analogous to artistic expression? Let's check out this quote. The juice is expressed by the wine press. And what is, it is, sorry, the juice expressed by the wine press is what it is because of a prior act. It is something new and distinctive. It does not merely represent other things, yet it has something in common with other objects, and it is made to appeal to other persons than the one who produced it, right? So my love song or my, my breakup song, if it's really good and it, you know, it's able to evoke these emotions, it is a new love song. It is something personal that I've, I've developed from my own personal experience, okay? But it has something in common with other heartbreak, with other people who have had a heartbreak, and then they can actually relate to it, okay? A poem and a picture present, present not represent, but present material passed through the Olympic of personal experience. They have no precedence in existence or in a universal being, right? It's my breakup. You know, it's unique to me. It's my loss right? It's not yours, okay? It has maybe similarities. Again, he says, nonetheless, their material came from the public world and so has qualities in common with the material of other experiences. While the product awakens in other persons new perceptions of the meanings of the common world, right? So this harkens back a bit to his point in the first lecture about the this sort of ultra individualistic nature of of modern art, right? And so, you know, which he 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 widely opposes. You know, for him, yes, there is personal expression, right? If I'm going to write a song about my bad breakup, you know, that's really emotional. This is something personal to me. This is something that I've dealt with myself, right? It's not your breakup, okay? But it's something that involves society, right? Breakups occur because there's other people and there's a thing called relationships and there's a thing called commitment. And these wouldn't exist if there wasn't a common world that we all shared, right? So in a certain sense, even though it's my own personal experience, the experience is taken on from materials of a common world in which we all share. And so through an effective and, and, and a passionate artistic expression, I'm able to tap into that communal aspect and, and able to draw others into that same experience, right? Or at least a similar emotional experience. So again, and we talked about this in previous videos, um, much like Heidegger, Dewey doesn't like these traditional philosophical distinctions between individual and universal, subjective and objective. He even mentions here freedom and order. Um, he thinks that these oppositions where in which philosophers have reveled, he don't think he doesn't think that these have any place in a work of art. For him, expression is a personal act and also an objective result uh, that, that, that results from that personal act. These are organically connected in a work of art. So it's personal and communal, and both of those elements of it are indispensable, right? They're not in opposition, but they're actually, in a sort of sense, there they're, 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 they're can't be one without the other. They're complementary, right? That they actually are 
only effective or possible because of one another, right? Uh, in, in at least the artistic expression is not possible without that tension of the environment, right? The wine press and also the emotional impulse, the juice in the grapes, right? That needs to spring forth. So again, more about representation and his sort of, uh, you know, his um, objections to seeing art as a form of strict representation of other things. He says, to, to, you know, to, uh, to say in general, he writes, that a work of art is or is not representative is meaningless, for the word has many meanings. If literal reproduction is signified by representative, then the work of art is not of that nature. For such a view ignores the uniqueness of the work due to the personal medium through which scenes and events have passed, right? So the artist has a medium, right? Whether it be through words or through paint or through a, a marker, a pen, you know, through music. And they use this medium to create something that's never been seen before, a new work of art, okay? So it's not representative in that sense. He mentions Matisse, right? The French painter, <clears throat> the French impressionist. Matisse said that the camera was a great boon to painters since it relieved them from any apparent necessity of copying objects. But representation may also mean that the work of art tells something to those who enjoy it about the nature of their own experience of the world, that it presents the world in a new experience which they undergo. Now, if that's what you mean by representation, I don't think Dewey would like the term. He's kind of has, has his issues with the term, but for him, that's fine. If what you mean is that it brings forth um, or presents the world in a new experience in which you undergo this work of art, you see things differently, you have a, a new insight, um, a new appreciation for love or, or art, or no, not art, I'm kind of redundant, a new appreciation for love or pain or human suffering, <clears throat> or just understanding somebody else's perspective, right? Th this is fine for Dewey, if that's what you mean by representation. But he's assuming, and I, I think that's a pretty safe assumption, that's not what, what most people mean when they talk about art as being representational. Now, when it comes to meaning in art, there's a similar ambiguity, right? There's a similar, <clears throat> you know, distinction or, 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 or difference of meaning between difference of meaning between meaning different senses of the word meaning it's like it reminds me of a passage from Wittgenstein the uh, Austrian philosopher right in his philosophical investigations he famously asked that question what is the meaning of meaning right what does meaning refer to and uh, you know Dewey's kind of pointing that out as well the term meaning has a similar ambiguity. When we look for meaning in a work of art, it's not really clear what we're asking for, right? Um, so words are symbols, he says, which represent objects and actions in the sense of standing for them. In that sense, they have a meaning. So that's one sense in which we can understand meaning. Meaning is is representational, right? So he gives the example of the signboard. A signboard has meaning when it says so many miles to such and such a place with an arrow pointing the direction. But meaning in these two cases has a purely external reference. It stands for something by pointing to it. Meaning does not belong to the word and signboard of its own intrinsic right. So sometimes a word stands for something else. If I write the word, um, you know, on the on the chalkboard, I say, go grab a pin from the desk, right? That word pin represents an object on the desk in the room, okay? It's a direction, it's pointing to something else. It um, It's what like the analytic philosophers would call, it's a referent, or that's, that's more uh, continental. What's the word? Yeah, no, it's referent. That's a Bertrand Ruff Russell uh, phrase, right? He, uh, <clears throat> for him, uh, he, he wrote an essay called On Denoting, right? And uh, words denote things. So words strictly represent things. But Dewey, like Wittgenstein, he sees something else going on, right? There's another sense in which words and signs and symbols have meaning. Yes, sometimes they do refer to other things. But sometimes the meaning is inherent in the actual sign. The, the work of art 
the sign itself is showing something. It's not pointing to or representing something else, right? So he explains, there are other meanings that present themselves directly as possessions of objects which are experienced. Here, there's no need for a code or convention of interpretation. You don't have to know what kilometers are or what arrows are. The meaning is as inherent in immediate experience as as is that of a flower garden, right? This kind of reminds me of the example from Kant. And in a way, he's saying something quite similar to Immanuel Kant. Remember what Kant says, that, that when I notice that a flower is beautiful, I don't have to understand the concept of flower. I might not even know what a flower is. Maybe it's the first time I've ever seen a flower in my whole life. But I see it and I, I notice it's beautiful not because it fulfills some conception of beautiful that's already there, it's a direct and immediate, okay? It presents something in a way that's just beautiful, it's direct, right? So something similar going on here in Dewey. He's kind of agreeing with Kant in that sense, but taking on sort of the, uh, what you would call a e etiological, no, not etiological, what's the word? Uh, uh, Etiology, yeah, yeah, the etiology, sort of the, 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 the meaning of the word. So, uh, that's not the right. Denial of meaning to a work of art thus has two radically different significations. Um, you know, again, it can signify what most of us think as just sort of denoting, right? What does a word mean? The word means what it represents. The word dog represents a certain animal of a certain kind, right? So that's one sense of meaning, okay? So when we say that art is meaningless, it may signify that a work of art has not the kind of meaning that belongs to signs and symbols in mathematics. And for Dewey, that's a contention that's just. Um, it's fine. Maybe that's not supposed to do that. It is its own meaning right it's got it's again it's meaning is inherent in the object itself or it may signify that the work of art is without meaning as nonsense is without meaning the work of art certainly does not have that which is had by another by flags when used to signal another ship but it does have that possessed by flags when they're used to decorate the deck of a ship for a dance. Okay, so this is an interesting distinction he's drawing, okay? The work of art certainly does have that, the kind of meaning which is had by flags used to signal another ship, but it does have that possessed by flags when they're used to decorate the, the deck of a ship for a dance. Okay, so if I'm using signals, signs, a flag, a white flag to signal surrender, black flag, anarchy, I guess, right? All this stuff. These do stand for other things. If I'm on a ship and, I, and I'm trying to signal another ship, you know, and, and I don't know anything about sailing, so I don't know what kind of sim signals you're supposed to use. So maybe I should have thought of a better example, but I'm just kind of going with his example. Um, that, is a, that is a notion of meaning in the first sense meaning as representation of other things. But this artistic meaning too, though, is, is much different. And if you wanna say that it's meaningless because it has this artistic meaning, you're in the wrong, okay? For, ne for, for Dewey, when I decorate the ships for a dance, for a celebration, right? Uh, for some big communal pageant or something like this, okay? The symbols have meaning, but the, the meaning is inherent in the, the symbols themselves, right? It's not representative of other things. And even if it does evoke emotional responses, it does so in a way that's unique and is very, is very much a part of that object itself, is the effect of that expressive object. It evokes something in me that wasn't there already. I wasn't happy before, but I see the bright colors of this ship. It reminds me of the great celebration that's about to take place. It puts me in the mood to celebrate the dance and so on and so forth. So when I say a work of art is meaningless, there's also another sense in which it could be completely nonsense and it lacks all these qualities that we're talking about. Okay? And so he, he says, and this kind of maybe reminds you of some of the things he says in the first lecture, 
um, about this sort of esoteric conception of art, which he opposes. He's not a big fan of separating art from the public, setting, separating art from lived experience. And so he does mention this here in the chapter on the expressive object. He says the den denial of meaning to art usually rests upon the assumption that the kind of value and meaning that a work of art possesses is so unique that it is without community or connection with the contents of other modes of experience than the aesthetic. It is, in short, another way of upholding what I've called the esoteric idea of fine art. Right, so I have this, this funny cartoon here on the right. You know, the guy's in the museum. The woman's looking at the painting. She doesn't understand it. And he says, well, of course you don't understand it. He's an artist's artist, right? He, you know, he's a part of this, you know, this, this secret cult of, of snobs who are the only ones who can really appreciate true art, right? Fully removed from the, the society at large, okay? Um, now, but for Dewey, art has this unique quality. It shouldn't be esoteric in that sense what it really is supposed to do and, and in a way this is very um reminiscent of schopenhauer um and maybe not just that but other artists too you you, you could say that kant to a certain extent um is going to um kind of be with this you know what what is what, the, what does the artistic genius do they're able to concentrate and clarify meaning uh, from the material of other experiences, right? Uh, experiences where, where there are meanings, but, but they're not so obvious to us, right? We pass by the barnyard and we don't notice the inherent beauty in the animals there, right? Whereas the painter walks by and instead of smelling the disgusting odors of the pigs and the chickens and, and all the noises of the barnyard, they see something beautiful there and they're able to take all that aesthetic you know, appeal and concentrate it on the canvas into a painting. And so we're able to see the beauty of it that we normally wouldn't be able to see because we just walk by and it's there, it's present, but as Dewey puts it, it's, in, in, uh, it's there in weakened or scattered ways. So, um, you know, to sort of clarify, you know, for him, when we're expressing something, we're, we're, we're taking part of an, art, an artistic expression. This is a lot different than simply stating something, some sort of scientific statement. That itself is meaning in the represent, representational sense, right? Meaning as in this word, this work of art stands for or represents something else, okay? But there's a difference between that and what Dewey is calling expression. So he says, the problem in hand may be approached by drawing a distinction between expression and statement. Science states meanings. Art expresses them, okay? So art is a matter of expression. Science is a matter of statement. Scientific statement is often thought to possess more than a signboard function and to disclose or be expressive of the inner nature of things. Dewey doesn't like this, right? This is where I think he, he would uh, definitely part ways with Kant. He would definitely part ways with, certainly with Plato, um, you know, and maybe from a lot of analytic philosophers. But for him to understand the inner nature of things, <clears throat> what they express, that's not what science is doing. Science is coming with statements of representation. If it did, if science did express the way art did, it would be in competition with art. And we would have to take sides and decide which of the two promulgates the more genuine revelation. But for him, we don't have to decide, right? There is something different going on in artistic expression and what he's calling the prosaic, right? Or, you know, scientific statement. The poetic as distinct from the prosaic. Aesthetic art as distinct from scientific expression. Expression as distinct from statement. This does something different from leading to an experience. It constitutes one. A traveler who follows the statement or direction of a signboard finds himself in the city that has been pointed towards. He then may have, in his own experience, some of the meaning which the city possesses, right? So as I'm walking towards let's say downtown San Antonio during the time of fiesta, right? And in a certain sense, this sign here I have pictured is representational in that sense. Its meaning is representational in that first sense 
of meaning that 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 that, that, that Dewey spoke of, right? So it it beckons me to the city. It beckons me to the celebration in town, right? But there's a certain aesthetic about it, right? It also has this vibrancy, right? It draws me in, right? There's a certain aesthetic appeal to it, right? The colors, the vibrancy. It, sh it has a certain character, right? So the, the colors are fiesta colors, right? They're the traditional fiesta colors, right? There's a certain character, a certain aesthetic to the city. I like this because out of all the philosophers so far that we've covered this semester, if you're taking this class in, at U of H, you're actually sitting through all this stuff. You're not just watching it for fun, for fun, for educational purposes, whatever, on YouTube. You know, to me, he's the first to use the term aesthetic in this sense, which is pretty common. You hear people talk about the aesthetic. I, I think at the beginning of the semester, um, if you were in my class, the first day of class, I gave the example of um, Quinn, Quentin Tarantino films. If you're familiar with the work of um, the director, Quentin Tarantino, his films have a certain aesthetic to them, right? Fiesta in San Antonio has a certain aesthetic to it. There's certain colors, certain designs. The posters are gonna have a certain vibrancy. There's the confetti, right? There's the sort of Dia de los Muertos, uh, uh, you know, that's around the same time. So, so all this stuff sort of is evocative of the fiesta, right? All of it together coalesces to form this experience, this, this uniform, unified um, aesthetic, right? So these signs aren't just pointing to a celebration. In a sense, they're a part of it, right? Um, the city, he says, might indeed be trying to express itself in a celebration attended with pageantry and all other resources that would render its history and spirit perceptible. Then there is, if the visitor has himself the experience that permits him to participate, an expressive object. As different from the statements of a gazetteer, or gazetteer however full and correct they might be, the poem or painting does not operate in the direction of correct descriptive statement, but in that of experience itself. So again, the sign that I look at, sort of the, 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 the happy fiesta sign, it's not just a function of, of, of pointing me in the right direction towards the, uh, the, the celebration, right? It is a part of the experience itself, right? It, it is an expressive object. There's a certain aesthetic to Fiesta in downtown San Antonio that's different from other celebrations. There's a similarity between Fiesta, you, you might say in Mardi Gras or Carnival, if you go down to Brazil, but they're all unique. They have their own personality. They have their own aesthetic and, and street signs are a part of that aesthetic. In this case, they're not just functional and representative of directional you know, advice, <clears throat> or orders, but a part of the whole experience and the aesthetic itself. <clears throat> you know, this class that I'm teaching, I'm teaching at University of Houston here in, um, in Texas, right in the heart of the city. And if you're a Houstonian and you've traveled, you know, throughout Texas, you'll notice, and maybe you've traveled outside of Texas, there's a certain aesthetic, I think, that Houston has that, that gives it a sort of personality, right? Cities have personality. Cities, in a certain sense, are expressive objects. The street signs are a little different. The traffic lights are a little different than other places. The roads are a different, right? Different contractors that make these roads that are local. And, and there might be very, very subtle differences. You know, somebody visiting Texas who's never been here might not really be able to see much of a difference between Austin and San Antonio and, and, and Dallas and, and Houston just by glancing at them or by looking at pictures of them or listening to a descriptive statement of them. But once you sort of spend time in them, you start to realize the personality of the city. And this is made up of the people, you know, the people that are there, the, the customs, the street signs, all this stuff comes together and it's a part of the aesthetic of the city. It's all a part in, in a sort of sense of the expressiveness of that experience. And in a sense, even something as mundane as a street sign can be, in Dewey's theory here, an expressive object. So this is a really good place to stop. Next video, we're going to get to the next chapter, chapter six, 
and we're not going to spend much time on it. It's very short excerpts. So the next video should be very short. We're going to look at what he says about substance and form. And, you know, this is all pretty technical. So again, you know, for my students, uh, I'm allowing you guys, if you want, you can go ahead and probably skip this next video. It's not going to be completely essential to understanding Dewey, but it is pretty interesting stuff. I think if you're an artist and you work with, you know, elements of substance, or sorry, shape, form, matter, uh, media, it might be kind of insightful. So I, I would recommend if you are an artist or you're just very fascinated by philosophy of art, go ahead and join us for that next video. Uh, but otherwise, I think, again, it's not completely necessary uh, to really appreciate Dewey's theory here. I think you kind of really get it. If you followed everything so far, you pretty much should have a pretty basic grasp of where Dewey's coming from and his general uh, aesthetics. Uh, but I would sort of, like I said earlier, jump to the last video and sort of get a nice big sort of tying the knot conclusion picture. I'm thinking again, it'll probably take me at least a good three or four more videos to get through all this stuff. So we're looking at like a, maybe like a 12 video series here, the longest one so far. Um, but again, thanks guys for sticking around and I will see you guys on the other.